not unmuted because news so because because noise carries back into the class uh, distracts me sure sir stop recording stop recording oh. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, everybody. And uh, we are on um, sort of the session four, I think, of um, organization theory. And we la last time around we talked about motivation. So we talked about some of the theoretical frameworks of motivation. So if you recollect, we uh, talked about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, we talked about Herzberg's two-factor theory. We talked about McClellan's theory of needs. And then we also uh, talked about um, Albert Bandura's um, self-efficacy theory. So these are some of the theories that we talked about and which are important. You should remember them uh, going forward. Um, uh, everything is not, please understand that everything is not common sense. Yeah, There are frameworks, there are models. That's why people do research and they do um, experiments. So today we look at how do some of these things translate into real life. So for example, uh, at the turn of the century, there was this gentleman social scientist called B.F. Skinner. Skinner is a very important person and he has impacted all your lives uh, greatly. So B.F. Skinner worked on, he, did, he was an experimental scientist. He was not a, so today many of us are we, we sit in a chair and think and speculate. You can also do research by experiment. Yeah? So for example, um, if I suddenly shout fire, fire, and how do you guys react? So do you sit there and smile at me? Do you make a dash for the door? Um, and then I can segregate this, do some statistical analysis, and finally emerge at a, with a model. Yeah. So these are interesting things. Experimental research is very interesting. So Skinner was a experimental researcher. India, not so great. The Americans very good at experimental research. I keep pushing my faculty that do some experimental research. So Skinner worked with two things. He worked with mice, rats, or, and he worked with birds. And he set up an interesting experimental box in which, you know, he, um, he had rats and he had a small lever. And he sort of showed the rat that if, if it pressed the lever, it got a food pellet. So eventually the rat figured out that every time it did some work and pressed the lever, it got a pellet of food. Does it sound familiar to you? That's what you do, right? You press a lever and you get a, you get paid. You do that on an everyday basis. So you have been trained to press that lever so that you get paid at the end of the... So Skinner was not satisfied with this experiment. He went further. And what he did was that he varied the pellet. So every time the rat pressed, it did not get a pellet. The rats who figured out in some time that if it violently pressed the lever, suddenly two, three pellets turned up. And it was a very interesting experiment because eventually the rats figured out that the more it pressed the lever, the more it was rewarded. And this reward came at variance. It, did, it was not a regular reward. Yeah, there was no, there was no equal dose of reward or food pellets that the rat got. And human beings are similar. And that's why you have variable pay. How many of you have variable pay? So all this variable pay came from B.F. Skinner's great experiment at the turn of the century. Because he showed that if you get variable rewards, yeah, like ESOPs, like bonuses, do you get a fixed bonus every time you work? Not necessarily, unless you're in a public sector. Yeah? Or do you get fixed ESOPs? Not necessarily. So B.F. Skinner showed that 
if people were given variable rewards you got you go worked much or you were encouraged to work much harder than what you normally do so that is the applic application of motivation to the real world and we look at some of the other strategies that sort of may exist so um the next uh, slide will show you something called as the job characteristic model the job characteristic model is very important because um uh because because eventually what seems to motivate people is the quality of the job and not the extrinsic rewards that you seem to get and so how how do we redesign jobs so that people are motivated and they are happy to do those jobs explain how specific alternative work arrangements what are alternative work arrangements that you can think of that are motivational job job rotation is very good yes it has its limitations but yes that is one one strategy that you can implement what else fun network okay okay we'll talk about it alternative work arrangements so he got one job rotation what else can you do work from, from, work from home office. work from home yeah absolutely work from home yes what else is not alternative is not so you, what's that upskilling yourself upskilling yourself okay okay how do you upskill yourself is is interesting we'll talk about that as well good point um internal job postings um is 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 a instrument we're talking about what is a strategy to sort of motivate people you can also what you are many of you are doing work, working from home is it motivating to work from home sometimes yes so for example if you have a small kid and you know somebody has to take care of that kid it can be motivating to sort of or you have an aged um um uh, parent or something like that that you want to take care of when you're at home you can sort of work from home it can be sort of useful and motivating so these are um alternative work arrangements that can motivate people to continue working yeah and describe how employee involvement measures can motivate how do you involve um employees what are some of the strategies of involving employees okay that you are making us what is on involve the employees how do you involve employees absolutely you can have town hall meetings right all of you have i don't know whether you speak or not or whether anybody listens to you but notionally these town hall meetings are for participative management and where people can come and sort of voice their yeah so for example somebody was telling me that um google about 6 months back had this uh, meeting where sundar pichai was saying that you know he was addressing everybody all google employees and he was saying that we have to cut down on unnecessarily travel and uh, because we because because the company needs to cut down some costs and so on and so forth the organization so somebody asked him in that meeting where are you addressing us from and he said new york so this is it was this necessary for you to go from the bay area to new york was this travel necessary or in a sense that is participative yeah uh, and and uh, even the big boss can be asked questions that is why it is a great organization so he said yes that it was very necessary for him to be in new york at that particular point of time so these are interesting concepts of motivating people demonstrate how the different types of variable pay programs so what kind of variable pay programs can you do you have so you can have something called as esops any of you have esops yeah stock option plans you have right so how do they work do they motivate you do do you feel that you are an owner of an organization what are the good parts about esops and what are the not good parts about esops and so on and so forth we'll have a quick look at that and um, show how flexible benefits can benefit can turn benefits into motivators 
identify the motivational benefits of intrinsic rewards. So for example, say if you're getting a lakh of rupees a month, from tomorrow your boss said you're going to get two lakhs. Does it motivate you? So Herzberg said no. Herzberg said that many years back that it might motivate you to a, to a short period of time, um, but then it stops motivating you after that. So that's, in, that's a, again, uh, how your mindset is culturally and where do you come from? Have you come from utter poverty where you, had, you did not have um, two square meals to eat? You were fighting for food, but suddenly somebody says one lakh to two lakh, obviously it will. So your own context matters here. Yeah? So there are several, several variables in terms of determining what the outcome may be. Um, so for example, I have this fetish for clothes. I can see it, I know. Um, I like to, um, first of all, I like to dress well, like you, have, you might have noticed, but I also like to have a stock of clothes. So if I don't buy clothes for the next two years, I'm absolutely fine actually. Yeah, because I've got a, and I can look, at, look back at it. And um, uh, when I was growing up, clothes were not very readily, or families did not believe that you must have a wardrobe. If you have two sets of clothes and one uniform, you were good to go. Yeah. So obviously somewhere it impacted me. And now I believe that since I have the wherewithal and uh, the money, I can sort of exercise my um, fantasies a little bit as far as dressing is concerned. So identify the motivational. Yeah, uh, true, because most of the time we, uh, we wore uniforms and I think that continued uh, into my service, but, um, uh, but, I, but I can look back at the psychological impact it might have had when I was a young person. Yeah. Uh, That's it. I think I think that applied to most families in those days. Yeah. So identify the motivational benefits of intrinsic rewards. So then there's a this thing about intrinsic rewards and extrinsic rewards. Um, can anybody tell me what the difference is? Extrinsic and intrinsic. I explained it in the last class. What is the difference between what's an extrinsic reward? So giving you money is an extrinsic reward yeah so i am giving you something or um making you um vice president is an extrinsic reward what is an intrinsic reward job satisfaction is an intrinsic reward do you feel you are contributing is an intrinsic reward do you feel that you have sort of uh, making an impact at your job and assisting other that's why people who work in NGOs and so on and so forth in the social sector seem to have high levels of high levels of intrinsic motivation. Um, say people serving in the armed forces, although they don't get paid so very very well, they seem to have high levels of intrinsic motivation. While people say working in your areas, the IT field, um, they get a lot of money apparently, but you can see high levels of again sometimes frustration and so on and so forth. They're always looking at other areas too. Yeah, so there was this student today morning who came and said, sir, I want to teach. Um, so I said, why? He said, I'm, I'm kind of a little bored with IT. So I was a little cruel and uh, I said, okay, excellent. But uh, maybe a couple of years down the line, once you finish your executive MBA, I can give you an opportunity if you want to take a few classes for the undergrad. And then we'll start from there. But I also went on to say that, you know, how they sort of catch in Southeast Asia, how do they catch monkeys? So, so uh, it's a very interesting uh, way of doing things. Um, <clears throat> so there's a bottle. So monkeys like ground nuts, right? They like peanuts. They can smell it from a distance. So they put a bottle in the ground. It's anchored to the ground and there are peanuts. And the monkey smells it and turns up. Now the monkey 
wants the peanut so it puts its hand into the open bottle and then it takes a fistful of peanuts the problem here is that now the monkey can't withdraw its hand because it's a fist and the monkey does not does not have the good sense to let go because it's now grabbed certain amount of peanuts so it it's not able to pull its hand out and so it keeps trying and keeps sitting there till it is trapped eventually and many of us are in that sorry state so we are monkeys we've got something in our fist and we are sitting so when do you let go can you let go can you let go of that money you know that you are miserable can you get can you let go of that extrinsic motivation good question for you to think about right are you a monkey sitting there with those peanuts so these are interesting questions and so um um yeah this is an interesting story i like to tell because there is a clear difference between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation so many people many many people are not able to let go of the extrinsic motivators for something else that they might want and also many people i see from industry who come to teaching assume that this is an easy job yeah farthest from the truth it is not yeah so um extrinsic motivators and intrinsic rewards and so on and so forth so let's go this this is a very important model and i want you to pay close attention because it is central to motivation theory it's one of the later theories and the job characteristic model talks about job redesign or how jobs are designed and um what is said in this framework is that um what really interests people in a job are five core dimensions you can see them here and they are skill variety that is so for example say for example if you were um if you were part of a a a, a say a assembly line say you were working in toyota kirloskar and your job for the entire day was fixing a tire or a wheel on a car is that an exciting job yeah the reason why it could be very boring and frustrating is that you are doing the same thing over and over and over again rather than bringing in various so all of us are skilled in various ways and that is what makes my job very very uh, interesting because i can teach i can administer i can write i can read um i can lecture i can go to a conference so the scope of bringing in your different skills are enormous as again say some jobs where you have to sit and code the whole day which again becomes a little bit tricky or you are working in a manufacturing plant and you are manufacturing a nut and bolt the whole day or you are uh, you know fixing a wheel on a car the entire day and so on and so forth so jobs become more interesting when you bring in more of your skill yeah so skills uh, whatever skills that you might have and so how do you bring that into motivational practices is very very important so the skill uh, variety part is important the task identity so um the task identity is um, what exactly are you doing yeah so so my common question is if you want to join a hospital would you be a surgeon doing heart surgery or would you want to be the head of security i think the most common answer is i would like to be the surgeon because the identity of the job is um is more important and or 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 the significance of the task is more important and you get an understanding of really what is happening in the hospital in terms of its main function right so um how do you translate this into real terms so for example um many of you how many of you write code so does your company have really explained to you where this code is going to eventually be used what is the end user going to do with it yeah so then if they are doing that it's a good sort of uh, an organization because they are giving you the task identity 
So the only company that I have seen in the manufacturing sector that really does this is Rolls Royce. And just for your information, all of you have heard of a Rolls Royce. So a Rolls Royce is is the, probably the only car that is customized. So a, a, a set of people come together and build a car and then eventually go and deliver it to the customer. So here you can look at it. Here you are building the car, you are putting it together, and eventually you are taking it and giving it to a, a customer. So that is um, what is task identity, that you know every bit of the job right from the start to the finish. People are not so lucky. So many times you are a cog in the wheel and you're just doing some part and you really don't know how it adds to the entire business operation. So task identity is very important. Do you know the full scale of the job um, along with the skills you bring in? And the task significance is how important is the job to the scheme of things? So again, obviously in a hospital, the surgeon definitely has a bigger significance or impact than a say head of sickness. Every job is important, but who has a greater impact? So say in the armed forces, would you want to be on the front um, facing the enemy or do you want to be supplying the troops with rations? So most people would choose, um, you know, being in the front unless you're really scared for your life and so on and so forth. Or say in the Air Force, would you like to be a ground engineer or would you be, like to be a jet fighter, a, a fighter pilot? Yeah. So obviously the answer to many people would be, I want to fly a plane because you want to be on the, in the significant part of the entire operation. So task significance is again, very important. And these three are dealing with the job itself. So skill variety, task identity, and task significance. And then you have two very important things that is autonomy. How much of freedom do you have? And that is why, again, my job is very exciting because I can actually uh, teach this class in many ways. I can show you 10 videos, not speak a word and say, you go and learn the, this topic from the video, videos, or I can lecture to you, or I can lecture for two hours and show videos for one hour. Yeah. So I can actually, you know, configure the class the way I want to do it, or I can write for one year or not write for the next year and so on and publish uh, for the next year. Um, I can also do some business development and so on and so forth. So the autonomy or the freedom on the job is very important. And if you have it, you must count yourself. Again, as, as a captain, I had a lot of autonomy and freedom. Nobody really interfered with my decision-making on a, on a ship. Yeah. So you, you must be very lucky to have that kind of freedom and autonomy. Autonomy is the right word that you should use in decision-making. And how do you manage your decisions on a in your job and eventually do you get feedback does somebody give you but please understand that um all high performers all high performers want feedback if they really want excellence in what they are doing they want feedback yeah so uh so these are the five core job dimensions and what are the critical psychological states they have? They experienced meaningfulness of the work, experienced responsibility for the outcomes of the work and knowledge of the actual results of the work activities. So it's a psychological state. And uh, what are the personal and work outcomes? High internal motivation, high quality uh, work performance, high satisfaction of the work, low absenteeism and turnover. So how do you know, say in your own job, in your own workplaces, and jobs. How do you know that somebody is not interested in work? What are the first indications? Or what is the first indication of deviant behavior? Coming Showing late. less interest towards the... Uh... Coming late to the office is the first indication that people are not... They are sort of losing interest in the kind of work that um, you know, uh, which is which is an offer to them, and it's fine. So um, it's a good idea to talk to them, and if really you can't get their interest levels up, maybe it's a good good opportunity to exit some of these people. Because why should you exit people like that? Why should you exit uh, 
Absolutely. So, so what researchers, I think mentioned in my last class as well, what researchers have found is that it's very difficult to lift bad performers to a level of excellence. It is much easier to, you know, get excellent workers to perform badly. And it's an unfortunate fact of life. So good companies will exit poor performers because it can infect the rest of the team or organization. People who are demotivated and who express dysfunctional behavior, coming late um, is the first sign of deviant behavior. Yeah. So lower uh, absenteeism and turnover. Good. So is this model clear? It's a very important. So you should also examine your own jobs or jobs in your team. So having fun at the workplace is not a great strategy. Because did you see fun anywhere here? It helps to a small extent. Yeah? But, but, but what really helps is the quality of the, the job and some of these five dimensions. So um, I don't think there is any great fun um, trying to climb up a peak, mountain peak at Cargill and getting the enemy out. But people are highly motivated still. It's an extreme example, I know. But but I somehow think that people are, I don't see too much of fun in my job. But it's greatly motivating and exciting because I can see the quality of the impact that it has on several other people and my own satisfaction levels and so on and so forth. Um, definitely, there was no fun being captain of a ship, I can tell you. But it was, again, highly interesting and motivating because the quality of the job itself was very, very interesting and good. That's the point I'm trying to make. Fun has its, so what, what kind of fun do they provide? What, what, what is, I'm curious about this fun part of the whole thing. They make you play cricket matches on Saturday afternoon. Secret Santa, one of them, okay. And what else happens? People get drunk on Friday evening. Huh. Fun Fridays. Fun Fridays. So one of my students was telling me that, uh, you know, uh, one of my students was telling me that, sir, Friday evening, we all go for a drink and we can drink as much as possible. So, okay. Uh, do, you, does your, do your parents know about it? Um, she said, no, not yet, but um, eventually they will get to know. But I'm puzzled with such activities, actually, from my point of view. Huh? You, of course, you can you can feel free to think the way you want to think. Right. So, uh, okay. So, some of the ways in which you can actually bring these uh, motivational theories to the um, job place are repetitive jobs provide little variety, autonomy, or uh, motivation. And one of the ways in doing it, as our friend here said, is job. What is job rotation? giving different types of tasks. So also you can move them to different job roles. For example, um, in a hotel, if somebody is taking care of housekeeping, can they, be, can they be moved to the reception area? Is a job rotation. But job rotation obviously has some levels of um, yeah, restrictions. Like what? Like what? Skills are required, yes. Some approvals are required, yes. For example, can I put the, the flight steward into the uh, uh, pilot's chair in an aircraft? Maybe not possible. Again, extreme example. But then because it involves safety of the flight. So job rotation is a good strategy to have for keeping interest levels up. So if you look at say, this, you can bring in a lot of skill variety. So if you have... If you have um, 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 job rotation, you can up the levels of skill that people can bring to the sort of table and show greater amount, greater amount of skill and so on. So, so job refer, rotation is referred to as cross training, periodic shifting from one task to another, reduces boredom, increases motivation and helps employees better understand their work uh, contribution 
weakness creates disruptions, require extra time for supervisors. And um, sometimes job rotation can also be stressful. If you're moving from say one job to another job, you have to, many people don't want to do it. They're quite happy being in a same comfort zone and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I want to do the same thing for the rest of my life. Um, uh, it's a very sad way of looking at life, but then there are also people like that who sort of don't want to do anything new or bring in new skills and learn something new. And um, it can be very stressful for a lot of people. So if say, if I move somebody from one job to another job, uh, they might just leave and go away. Yeah. What do you guys think? You think job rotation is a good strategy? You don't think so? Why? He's shaking his head. Lot of work. To an extent is good. And that's what you have mentioned, sir, that it increases motivation. Also, it helps a person in upskilling. So maybe doing a same work at times it happens, it becomes so, like a comfort zone for a person. Absolutely. I think well put, very well put. What's your name? Arpita. Arpita, yes, I think Arpita, you put it well. So, my friend, why do you why did you shake your head? I mean, you know, why why do you think it is not a good option? What do you do right now? Okay. okay. So, how do you learn new things? Do you think it's important to learn new things? That you agree. Um, why is it important to learn new things? So, yeah, again, we're getting back to that, right? So, why do you want to develop new skills? Absolutely. So, you are looking at your own survival. So, if you, unless you are developing new skills, you will not be competitive and you may not have a job sometime going into the very near future. And that's why we are like that rat on the treadmill, pressing that lever yeah, and learning new skills because you want those food pellets to sort of, it's an unfortunate fact of life, but that's how it is. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Let him finish. One second. Excuse me, sir. May I speak? Absolutely. He's a good manager because he's trying to introduce some amount of chaos. Yeah. Uh, and that is very good for you. Anybody who sort of pushes you out of your comfort zone is, um, is, is it, it, it's important because you get to learn new things. And unless you have certain amount of chaos or insecurity, you are not learning new things. Uh, so let's go to the guy online. Yeah. Um, yeah. You were saying something, my friend. Online. Yes, yes, sir. I'm Kiran. Uh, there is one more theory which I have read, uh, which is called job specialization. That okay. theory uh, totally contradicts with this uh, job rotation. Hmm. No job specialization. So, so the idea, the idea is not to rotate between jobs and not know anything about it. So the idea is to rotate between jobs and then specialize in it. So, for example, if you are if you are like, taking care of housekeeping, you are expected to bring uh, fresh and clean towels and specialize in it. And somebody puts you into the reception area, you're supposed to specialize there as well. So uh, Kiran, I think you're getting a little confused. Today, it's the world of both depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge. You need both, it's T-shaped. You need, you need a vertical eye where you are deep in some particular area and you need breadth of knowledge as well so that you can connect several dots. Yeah, so there's no contradiction there. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. It means let them specialize in that and then rotate them into the related jobs. Absolutely. You need to specialize. You need to specialize and then you need to sort of... So, so it's like, say, I rotated between two careers. One was I'm a navigator. I'm an ocean engineer. I did marine engineering. Was I specialized in that job? You bet I was. I would not have made captain otherwise. So that does not mean that I become a professor and then say, no, I'm going to float over here. Do I have to, do I have to specialize here as well? Answer is yes. 
you have to work yes, really sir. hard to sort of specialize in two areas and that's the point you rotate and then specialize and actually Thank the you. job rotation could be also an answer for the frustration of the employee absolutely I mean, like absolutely because if you are learning new skills you could you could sort of move um say say move careers transition roles go to different areas and then uh, see what works for you best so it could sort of uh, allay uh, frustrations that creep in and so on and so forth. thank you sir so that's your so uh, then obviously you will never get promoted and you might pre probably also get uh, uh, sent home yeah but you know it's a it's a um, i was reading i was reading um, i was reading an account of a, a survivor from auschwitz and i'll talk about auschwitz a little later. auschwitz was this concentration camp in uh, poland and they were they were asking a, a, a young a person who got out that how did you so many six and a half million people died in concentration camps how did you sort of um um how did you survive and this person says that you know my parents told me that whatever happens don't die yeah so i can hear this constant chatter anybody wants to add something here so um um so so you can sort of um see uh, the assumption here is that everything is easy it's not you can choose how you want to live your life yeah you can do the mundane ordinary things and don't complain later you know don't complain that somebody else is getting the promotions or the big bucks and so probably they worked extremely hard for that to happen so uh, or 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 people may not have the mental ability to absorb many things it's fine there is nothing wrong in saying that i will retire as assistant manager but then you can't compare yourself with somebody else who has worked very hard and who has those intellectual capabilities and done well and then say that i should have been with that like that person without having put in the effort what do you think said yeah so um um so for example communism when you when 1917 when the soviet union the russia had the revolution many people say that you know the revolution was not about bringing in equality and you see it in many societies across india it is not about bringing in equality it is just that i am jealous of somebody else so i want to cut down that person and bring him to my level it is not about improving society it is about destroying somebody who is doing better than me and human beings unfortunately are like that so you can choose actually yeah so job rotation is a good strategy many organizations use it and it sort of uh works well you can also have job so job enrichment is a little different what is job enrichment what do you think is job enrichment absolutely so increase the difficulty levels in a particular job yeah so um so 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 somebody is doing um a particular task you give them greater responsibility or work so that they sort of um find it more difficult you increase the difficulty levels but what's the catch here you increase difficulty levels in a particular job but you don't pay them more money why why should you pay them more money why should you just increase the difficulty of the job but not pay them more money there will be no motivation for him to do that extra job why 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 i want you to use the right word why lord sharma why don't you pay people more money for increasing the job difficulty why is it not job enrichment then is a paal order pani irukama vera enna venum vittu hmm maybe to see uh, if the person is actually you know uh, open for learning or uh, maybe he's only interested for the Would motivation say... factor like money only is the motivation factor or the learning maybe to gauge on who that is, who is the sharanya is it 
Who speaking? Arpita, sir. I'm I'm answering. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. Um. Uh. Please go ahead. Repeat again. What you said. So I was saying maybe at times uh, they increase the difficulty of the job, but not uh, maybe in, in enhance the amount uh, or the package in your salary, you could say. So maybe because to see if the person is ready to learn or give his efforts for, you know. Yeah, uh, I think I think right answer, but I want you to use the right word. Okay. So maybe to see. I, I, I think I told I you. I want to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to bring in extrinsic motivation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. want it, you want it to be intrinsic in nature, and you, you're right. You want to see whether the person is willing to learn, learn and bring in new, more skills Correct. without getting any amount of extrinsic motivation. Yes. That's the general idea of job enrichment. Again, um, some people like it. Some people like the additional responsibility. So your manager calls you and tells you, "Look, I'm giving you additional responsibility, but I'm not going to pay you more money." And some people like it, and some people like our friend here may not like it. Yeah, that uh, you know because he wants to spend the rest of his life not working hard, uh, which is fair. I mean, it's your point of view and how you want to live life is your business. But then you could have several such people. Um, but there are other people who want greater and greater responsibility, and they want to sort of move up the ladder. So job enrichment is a, is again another strategy. You can also have relational job design to make jobs more pro-socially motivational. That is, what is pro-socially motivating? Like connect employees with the beneficiary. Like I give you an example of Rolls Royce, where eventually you can actually your team can go and deliver the car to the customer or the person who pay who's paying the money, or meet beneficiaries firsthand. So again, um, say um, some organizations also allow you to go and one day in a month or something like that, they go and do some social work and things like that. So um, these are interesting um, strategies for increasing what? Increasing intrinsic motivation. I am not talking about money is, money is a very, very poor way of motivating people. And I want you to, Absorb that. You can't keep paying people more and more money and assume that it is going to motivate them. It's a very, very poor and impoverished way of looking at work. It doesn't work in the long term. And um, uh, you can assume that if you get, today you're getting one lakh, suppose somebody pays you 10 lakh a month, I will work much harder. It doesn't happen. You're not a donkey. Yeah. Huh? Um, so unfortunately, soon you're back to your levels of one lakh. Uh, another interesting, so something that may not actually be, you uh, you know be cog you may not be cognizant of job sharing. Job sharing is used in say um, jobs like oil rigs, where two people share a particular job. Why? Uh, because the job is very difficult. So for example, just think about it. If you have to go and live on an oil rig for a year, it can be very, very difficult. So what ONGC does is they place people on an oil rig for 15 days and then the guy comes home and then they put another person there and he serves for 15 days and then they keep rotating. And they have different ways of paying these people. So they get paid very highly for 15 days they get paid almost nothing or very little for the next 15 days that they're sitting at home, but then it balances out in the long term. But job sharing, I don't know really whether any of you have experienced job sharing in your jobs. Not very common in the kind of jobs that you have, but they do exist. Uh, airline pilots also do job sharing. So you can actually be flying for say one week and then you can be relaxing at home for, but please understand again that the money is not the same. You don't get paid the same amount for sitting at home. You get a lot of money for flying an aircraft and then you're sitting at home and not making much money. Yeah. So job sharing, um, yeah, declining in use and so on. Yeah, telecommuting is all, what all of you do. You're all sort of very cognizant of telecommuting. That is working from home. Yeah, you can sort of 
um, particularly with the with the onset of IT, where you can sit at home and I don't know. I don't know really how well it's working. Does it work well, working from home? Yeah, it's Sometimes. the situation, sir. Yes, mainly based on the situation. So, what situation is that? It's it works well in what situations? So when you yeah. have COVID, it, it works. It well. saves when you are not well, or maybe um, it's actually well works well at my domain. What why why I feel because I spend a lot of time in traveling because I stay in at one side and my company is completely on the other side. So I feel like mm -hmm. I save a lot of time in traveling. Yeah, good point. I Fair point. Home. But most of the people I see working from home are wearing old clothes and wandering around as if they are lost or they've seen a ghost and um, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, they have not had a bath for several days, maybe. Uh, and and uh, they look very sad to me. Um, uh, very rarely you see them smile even. Um, yes, uh, uh, so I agree, uh, Dean. Like, uh, no, it's not working well for them as well as for the organization. That's my opinion. And probably until they push themselves back to office, uh, they will not realize that what mm. they are losing. Yeah, and also some of them say that they are fighting more with their spouse, uh, or or they they because shared spaces suddenly bring home all the negative qualities in them, um, and, and people are getting irrit you know irritated and. Uh, kids are also at home now and you know you could come home and pet them like a dog in the evening but now you have to sort of encounter them the entire day um uh, and and it's bringing, it's bringing some realities to the fore yeah um i had a tough time during corona where i had to sit at home for say a couple of months and i like to get to the office every day um it's very interesting. but that's my per personal point of view no no uh, if you like to stay at home and work and telecommuting is working for you and it's motivating you, good for you. Yeah. But several organizations are now, even the US, several, several organizations are reconsidering telecommuting, telecommuting and saying that you have to come back to the office because they are they are seeing problems developing. Yeah. Are you saying something? Yeah, you can also be more, you can also be productive working from office. Yeah, but, 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 but I get the point that what the lady was making that, you know, she's commuting for long distances. Say she's spending, um, You can, you can be productive while working from the moon also. That is not the point. The point is, the point is, what is, the point is, what is, see how the world operates is what is good for an entire set of people. Yeah, eventually that is what gets, um, so for example, do you like democracy? Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, I may not like democracy, but democracy is apparently liked by the majority of 1.2 billion Indians. So we have, it's not my personal like or dislike. So the point I was trying to make is telecommuting is a motivational tool. In many circumstances, it motivates people, but there are disquieting voices emerging about the utility of telecommuting as a strategy. And how long do you allow people to work from home? What are the advantage to the disadvantages if you compare the two? So for example, Suppose I have a strategy of telecommuting and say, all of you work from home. What are the advantages? One is I can say I don't need a building. So I can save on rent. Two is I don't have to pay you for transport. Three is I can reduce the carbon footprint. Yeah. Four is that maybe you're motivated and you're producing really well. What are the downsides? One is I don't know what you're doing really. Yeah. Two is there is an apparent loss of connect between various employees. So you're going to have sort of, you're going to have issues in terms of um, uh, how, social skills are important finally. You know, how do you interact with people? And like she was saying, can you discuss a problem one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, uh, or are you working on something that you have nothing to discuss with anybody else? I don't think there are too many jobs like that. Are you in one sub job? You have nothing to discuss with anybody else. 
so you're in such a job so maybe that's why it's working for you yeah so it doesn't work for me because every 10 minutes i meet i need to meet a faculty to discuss something yeah so obviously it doesn't work for me because i can't pick up a phone every 10 minutes and call somebody here it's much easier they sitting next door we have a quick discussion we strategize on something so you can have um, it's also very job related in its context but the bigger picture here is that several companies are now going back on their work from home policies so some of the jobs uh, really required to be present like uh, construction industry and other places where uh, they cannot work from home right uh, can you talk in that context yeah yeah so you are right so the so how do you fly a plane from home or how do you navigate a ship from home or how do you fight a war from home uh, uh, or or uh, there's also a point for, a point here for guys online that the hybrid part of it that is some days you work from home some days you go to an office uh, is again may or may not work yeah so um yeah, it's a it's a it's a thought process but um my my sense of what is happening in the world is that um we are shifting away from this whole work from home business back to the office and hybrid the hybrid program i think is the transition so you sort of um yeah so for example so for example we had a very interesting uh, experience where um several years ago our mba full time mba program used to operate from our other campus and yeah uh, my boss wanted it moved here and he asked me uh, so nagraj what do you think is it a good idea to move i said yes absolutely this is a much better setting for a professional mba program and he said what do you think the students want i said they don't want to shift the students are not happy about shifting why um, because there there is very little control there are a lot of eating places around it's a so called fun trip yeah and uh, uh, everybody is quite happy so what we actually so i called all of them they sat i think in this very room i told them the advantages and the disadvantages of shifting we took a poll vote yeah they decided not to shift so 60 40 they decided that they want to stay in that campus the next year's admission happened here so the new batch moved here so one year they came here one year it ran from there they suffered very badly in terms of placement yeah and um uh, life went on so that's all there is to it so you get what you want there are consequences to pay yeah if you are smart enough to understand those consequences and make those sacrifices then um it's okay um but if there are outcomes and consequences that, that are not so happy don't complain later so that's why we live in a democracy you have a right to choose what you want but you also have the responsibility to live with the consequences that come your way yeah so um telecommuting and uh, um so some of the advantages of telecommuting telecommuting is positively related to objective performance and job satisfaction reduces work family conflict so telecommuting can actually reduce your role conflict particularly for women who have sort of issues in managing work and family and so on and so forth and i mentioned this point reduces carbon emission so what is carbon emission uh, what is carbon emission my friend do you know what's carbon emission last guy yeah what is carbon footprint you have any idea i am asking you you don't have i suggest you find out because you are going to go through that yeah you if if you're going to have greenhouse gases and you're going to have climate change i think you are the right age to go through it and that smile might actually disappear from your face when you find out the dangers that you're going to go through yeah so um carbon emission is a serious problem that people of your generation will go through and i suggest you stay cognizant of what is happening for example 
um they estimate in the next 30 years bangladesh will be subsumed by the sea just think about it if a country like bangladesh disappears what do you think is going to happen who is next is far away what is going to what is going to happen to those people where did they come yeah their favorite destination is india we actually did a study uh, my full time mba students did a study with um, a swiss company yeah they were trying to see if they can move their office from china to vietnam but the problem is that vietnam is also going under the the sea because of the rising sea level because of climate change and so if they move their entire operation to say a country like vietnam and the country goes under what is the future of their business so this is a serious problem so getting your next bonus may not actually be as important as trying to figure out how the world is shaping up in many of these so many of these issues are extremely important in these days and how do you reduce carbon footprint and there's definitely telecommuting reduce this carbon emission or carbon footprint why why does it reduce your lesser vehicles on the road you are not driving if you look at bengaluru uh, most cars have one person in it and why because all of you are you know earning well and you are getting uh, bonuses and increments and so on and so forth so you can buy one car then your wife can buy one car and then both of you can drive separate cars and so on and so forth does it cost society unfortunately it does yeah so don't take it lightly right so what are some of the disadvantages social loafing social loafing what is social loafing taking your dog for a walk while you should be working uh, really nobody knows what you are doing and so on and so forth uh, difficult to coordinate um, team work difficult to evaluate non quantitative performance yeah um that is the quality of the work yeah so am i teaching now am i teaching now yeah but what about the quality of the teaching i can actually reduce this lecture also to a non a very very kind of boring lecture which makes no sense at all am i in the class the answer is yes have i logged in for the class the answer is yes but the quality is difficult to measure yeah in if you're not in the office many senses uh increased feeling of isolation and that's a problem and reduced coworker relationship quality so what are we talking about yeah and may not be noticed by for his or her efforts so again um you can decide what really works for you okay so um we are talking about um employee involvement that is participative management or representative participation so participative management is um how do you participate in management like i said um how else can you how can else can you participate in management how were people participating in do you participate in your management or you are you so small that nobody really cares how do you how do you participate your surveys gallup polls what else do how many of you have a trade union you have a trade union where do you work that has a trade union are you part of the union what do you do no what do you do but are you a blue collar worker do you work on a machine do you make nuts and bolts do you give injections to somebody do you wear a boiler suit you can't be part of a union so you're part of some association but are you i so what what do trade unions do so trade unions were the last vestiges actually as far as i am concerned which gave representation to to people yeah against the and they could sort of discuss with the management 
what has happened to trade unions it companies don't have them definitely why how many of you work in it company why don't you have a trade union they are working professionals other people are non working professionals what an interesting thought labor uh, i would say you know the for example huh. uh, uneducated and other i mean not only that um, um i i have uh, one um, you know uh, we have all the solutions for you know organized way of solutions we have for uh, it employees and uh, like we also providing like gallop and other service we are having it up maybe that's the reason we don't have it that's what i thought thank you okay okay yeah the interesting thought isn't it why does a company say like toyota kirloskar uh, do you think they are doing good work many of us drive uh, toyota right and they do physical plastic. labor okay you do what mental labor i mean it guys do what but both are laboring in some sense yeah um no. yeah go ahead not blue color uh, uh, not blue collar uh, uh, job profiles in it companies maybe okay okay so what kind of collar do you have uh, we call it uh, white so, collar uh, so it job professionals what they do if they are not satisfied they immediately shift to other job mm, as long as you can shift <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, several people in America are finding out it's not that simple. Yeah, where 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 they can sort of get laid off and then shift. So are they actually the notice periods are two weeks only, sir? I mean, they just shift like uh, anything. Like I think we are digressing, but but uh, I had I had a very you know senior guy from Walmart in my office the other day, and he's saying the draw jobs have dried up. He says the. two years back everybody had three jobs in their hand today they have no job so it's a very quick turnaround yeah and um, yeah but the interesting reason is why do it companies not have a trade union you might like to think about it and actually um decide whether you want a trade union or not and why do manufacturing companies have a so one of the answers is the white collar blue collar divide yeah and um so the 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 genesis of it lies in the indian constitution which says that there is something called as a factories act a factory is a place which is powered which has got machinery do you have machinery in it company so functionally what you are are is a shop yeah you the the it companies come under the shops and establishments act you are not a factory so all of many of you are working in shops it's not a factory so you are not mandated to have a trade union like several uh, manufacturing companies and in that sense you do not have participation in management you are part of the management yeah so again uh, i don't know whether i mentioned it to you but trade unions were very powerful say about 50 years ago 30 years ago today trade unions you don't see much of them the again interesting question is why why don't you see too many trade unions um, in this time and age is something for you to think about yeah so participative management and representative participation are both very very important in terms of um you know uh, motivating people why because people feel that they are an important stakeholder in the workplace if they have some participation so you can do joint decision making trust and confidence Uh, studies of participation performance have yielded mixed results and so on and so forth you can read all this of the ppt so workers works council board representatives um um workers are represented by a small group of employees who actually participate in decision making so um interesting did i tell you the story about uh, um just to end this um uh, conversation about participative management what toyota uh, are you aware that toyota has a manufacturing plant in bengaluru yeah okay so the, at bidadi right so um uh, toyota uh, toyota um, 
uh, had ha, has had some problems. One of the problems came from the fact that anybody works at Toyota Kia Los Angeles. So one of the problem was that um, workers and even the management is Japanese of the of the organization. So the workers they decided that their bathroom break should be fifteen minutes. Um, do you think that is fair? Every time I want to go to the washroom, it's fifteen minutes. What is your point of view? You can have any point of view, yeah. So, but uh, they decided we want fifteen minute break. The Japanese management did some research, calculated, and said every time somebody wants to go to the washroom, they take they should not take more than three and a half minutes. And that was the genesis of the problem. And we'll come to group theory um, a little later after we take a break. But the union decided that the Japanese management, who are these fellows who have come from Japan and they're talking too much, we need 15 minutes because we want to have a cigarette and then we want to also talk to our friends and relatives along the way and then do things slowly and come back. So we will, not, we will strike work. And they went on a what is called as a wildcat strike. That is, they said, from this point onwards, we stop working. So the Japanese management, how do you think they will respond? They cared, they cared. What do you think they did? Till it happen. What do you think? How Suppose you are the Japanese management, how will you respond? Your workers have said, your dear workers, you know, um, all of you are one family and all that. They have said they are not going to work from this moment onwards. We'll call for discussion and sort it out. Call for discussion and sort it out. So what the Japanese management did is they kicked everybody out of the plant and said, go and stand outside the gate. And they brought a big padlock and locked the gate and declared what is called as a lockout, which is as per the constitution of India. So the workers now were caught by a little bit by surprise because like you said, they thought somebody is going to call them for a discussion and negotiation. And um, <clears throat> that didn't happen. So they went and filed a complaint with the labor commissioner. And the labor commissioner said, what nonsense? How can they do this? And he summoned the management for a discussion and negotiation. The Japanese management said, we are not coming. So now the labor commissioner also was a little yeah, puzzled, frustrated, angry. He did not know what to do. So he suggested to the workers union that go and complain to the Karnataka government. So they went and complained. So the labor minister, whoever he was at that point in time, called the Japanese management for the CEO here for a from Dibbidhi, come for a discussion at the Vidhan Sauda. So the, a date was fixed. So the workers and their representatives turned up for the meeting. They waited, kept looking. Not, nobody came from the management side. So they called the Japanese management. They said, where are you? They said, no, we don't feel safe. We are not coming. So all this time, the workers are not getting paid. Yeah? And... They said, okay, we'll fix one more meeting. We'll see, we'll take care, we'll call the police, we'll get everything. You please come for the meeting. Now it became, please come. So two weeks later, same thing again happens two weeks later, Japanese management refuses to show up. Then the government of Karnataka tells them that, look here, if you guys do this, we will have to take strict action against you. So the Japanese management tells them, do that, we will shift to Gujarat. Everybody shut their mouth. And what do you think was the cigarette break? After that. The cigarette, the sorry, the, the, the washroom break. Three and a half minutes. Everybody went back to work. But this was not the case 50 years ago. What has changed in India? That's the interesting question. Workers' representation was very solid about 50 years back. This situation was unheard of. What has changed in India? That today, actually a company can stand up to a government. And the Karnataka government is very powerful, right? This is a fairly rich state. What has changed? Why 
one is alternate opportunities available to what else yeah today if you look at the the richest 50 countries in the world you will find that 20 of them are companies yeah if you had come if you had if you had market capitalization for example let me let me give you an example if you compare the gdp of pakistan and the market capitalization of google which do you think is bigger google is bigger yeah it just wakes you up to the fact of how powerful these companies have become they are bigger than a countries apple apple is not very far from india's total gdp they are behind but not by much too much yeah if india's economy drops and there's they're they're selling more and more phones you people are buying them one day they will be bigger than india so it's very interesting so today countries find it very difficult to muscle company th these kind of companies around and trade unions or workers participation has actually declined it has not in respect of the fact that you guys have what is that uh, town hall meetings and so on and so forth in a real term real sense workers participation has actually declined in many parts of the world because of the rise of the multinational corporation and uh, job opportunities that are available and op also opportunities that many people have from shifting one job and that's a good thing also that in a rising economy we have so the last point i want to cover is the esop um what is an esop employee stock option plan where you are given discounted shares which will vest over a period of time so for example you go and join microsoft um in 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 um, the bay area in the us they will give you $50000 of stocks and they say that at a discounted price and they say that every year you can sort of sell certain amount of stocks yeah and you can sort of um um yeah you make money if the stock price goes up so what happens the stock price drops you don't I mean, you don't make money is a better um so so large amounts of salary particularly for whom for whom do you have large amounts of salary going into uh, esops what kind of people is it the chaprasi this the ceo of a company gets most of his pay in terms of why why should you do that why should you give the ceo most of his salary in terms of stock options right. tax benefit no certainly not tax benefit sir no how would you like your do you like do all of you like a fixed pay i get x amount of money every month in my account or you like a variable pay i get 1/5 as fixed pay 80% is variable pay what do you like so all like all good indians i will answer that for you you want it should come into my account i don't want to work uh, too much i mean if money should come into my account and i should be quite happy the esop unfortunately is variable pay so because you are not making money unless the stock price is going up so it is like that on a treadmill you are on a treadmill and you are running all the time and so should ceos be on the treadmill answer is yes of course yeah ux that's why they they get the big bucks right they get they get a lot of money so that you sort of they work much harder what's the problem so far so good esops what's the problem esops as a motivating tool motivational tool which is a good thing 
Okay. This is also a good thing. This is also a good thing. What's the problem? Suppose, suppose, suppose you are the CEO of your company, of a company, and you have got a million dollars in ESOPs. And the price of the share is dropping. Does it bother you? Does it bother you that your company is going down or your personal wealth is dropping? Company value going down. Not your wealth, wealth personal wealth. If company grows, we grow, right? So if major, the main should be the company should grow. So if it's growing, then yes, even our jobs and everything will grow eventually. But if we look at only us, so it doesn't yeah. make sense so, that the company will also grow. So yeah. therein lies the, you're right. So therein lies the problem. So the problem here is that, so they found, I don't know how many of you, of you have heard of this company called Enron. I think it's there in the case study. Some group must have got Enron, if you're bothered to read, yeah? Um, Enron is a very class. Enron was the darling of Wall Street from 1996 to 2001. Have you anybody heard of Enron? Enron, not Amron. Okay. Amron is that advertisement. Rabbit used to come with advertisement. Selling batteries, right? No, no, I'm not talking about Amron. This is, this is Enron, which was, uh, like I said, um, it was set up in the 1980s and it was the, the, say, the Wall Street's most innovative company for five years from 1996 to 2001. Um, the United States deregulated energy, the energy market. So that means people could buy energy, store it, and then supply it at their own cost. I mean, whatever they wanted to charge. So where do you have private energy in India? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody who sells energy privately? Electricity privately. Okay. Anybody else? Who was before Adani? Before that, the Tatas, of course. Yeah, the Tatas in Maharashtra um, sold power. So Enron was one such company. The the uh, the problem with Enron was that you should read the case. But to cut a long story short, the CEO and the CFO did a lot of stuff which was not very ethical in keeping the stock price up, which was fraud. Yeah, basically they defrauded several hundreds and thousands of Americans and people by fudging their accounts. And eventually when the company went down, a lot of people lost, um, lost money, not jobs. They lost money, yeah? So, um, ESOPs as a motivational tool is good as long as your organization, any, you can, can you think of any Indian company which defrauded uh, shareholders and fudged their account books? Satyam is an excellent Satyam. example. So if you can compare Satyam and Enron, Enron was about thousand times bigger. So you can, you can sense the impact that en Enron must have had across the United States mostly. Why does it have such a big impact? Why do you think when a company as big as Enron goes down, why do you think it creates an impact to normal people like you and me? How? So several people bought shares, I accept that. How else? Excellent. Also, you have collateral damage. What else? What else? So, to, so say tomorrow, today, tomorrow, say if Reliance, the Tatas, HDFC Bank, and ICICI Bank disappear, do you think it impacts you? How? How is your money? Yeah. Uh, you are HDFC, okay. So, he, where do you work? He is not currently working. Does it impact him? Please understand that even if you have a life insurance policy or you're saving money in life insurance, they might be investing in one of these 
organizations. Yes. Yeah? A lot of your PF money might be in invested in many of these. How do you think you get that eight and a half percent or seven and a half percent? Yeah, they might have invested. So that is what happened to America. Several banks, several pension funds, several other organizations had invested their money in Enron because everybody thought it was a great company. And when their sort of CEO and CFO and other guys defrauded because of falsifying accounts and so on, a lot of people lost their livelihood and money. So ESOP motivational tools are good. And that's the problem with money. When people feel that their money is at stake, they do. They do stupid things. Nobody has a problem. They do what? They do unethical things. Yeah. Which sort of affects a lot of other. You understand the word unethical? What is unethical? So, for example, um, what are all of you? What else are all of you? Good, good. I like the answer. What else are all of you? I keep getting all this all the time. Uh, working professional, working professional. Do you know something? Do you know something? I get more cases of copying in working professionals than MBA first, first, first full time MBA students. Yeah, just think about it. Just think about it. Yeah, and then they're they're aghast when they're caught copying. I'm a working professional. So so so, uh, I tell them that if you're a working professional, then you should be more ethical. We'll stop there and take a break on that note, and we shall come back at what time? Eleven fifteen. Yeah, guys online, we're taking a quick break, please. Yes, so please sir. don't copy. Okay. Sure, sir.
okay mm -hmm. and um, one of 12 12 o'clock okay so we are moving on to um, what is called as group behavior now what i wanted to tell all of you is that i've started correcting the assignment one and uh, generally i've taken some trouble of going through your presentation and so on and um, the worst thing that you can do so so please understand how the system works if you get say 25 in the first assignment and 25 in the second assignment you already passed the pro course yeah the problem that i see with many people is they get say 24 in the first assignment and then don't do assignment 2 so you are stuck with 24 so you got 24 and 0 yeah if you get 24 that is what what percentage of 60 is that 24 out of 60 is what percentage 40% 40% yeah so 40% technically is that you have cleared the assignment that means you cannot revisit your assignment again yeah and you will then have to get fairly high marks in the trimester end exam to pass if you get 22 in your first assignment then you are considered to be failed you can resubmit both so if you are not if you are not submitting if you already sort of and if this goes to the examination department that you got 24 and above and you don't do assignment number 2 you are going to have a problem so then you 40 you already passed or well, i'm saying sometimes people get say 25 in the first assignment and don't do the second assignment that means you are stuck at 25 out of 60 yeah suppose you get 30 on 30 in both brilliant you're up for the gold medal is that's what you're aspiring for yeah am i clear guys on line also yes sir yes sir yes sir okay yes, sir. so let's let's go on to the next um, uh, topic of discussion can i have some silence please sir one query here uh... yes Yeah, so if we are already scoring like for example twenty five, twenty five in two assignments, and uh, the last exam we are scoring zero, so we'll be failed, right? No. You will be failed if you don't turn up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Suppose you suppose you turn up, and then you know greet everybody, and then sit there, and then you mark the attendance sheet, and you leave without trying to copy. You have passed. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and sir, like uh, the you said, you have corrected some of the assignment. Like once you have done, uh, will we be able to see it in the same LMS portal? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sir. One more question. Like uh, one of the assignment I just checked, it is actually mentioned status as checked. So I don't see any feedback in it. So that means is everything good or? Uh, is... So how many marks did you get? Twenty-four. So twenty-four out of thirty is what percentage? Most more than forty. Forty. Chief, chief, twenty-four out of thirty is what percentage? It's a uh, almost half. Almost half, sir. Twenty-four out of thirty is what percentage, sir? Seventy. please 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 don't i mean you are you are you are beginning to i am you are shaking my confidence in the indian schooling system 80% 80% yeah yes that's correct 24 out of 30 is what percentage sir 80% that means you are 80% good okay okay fine sir can we move on please so foundations of group so somebody has got 30 out of 30 you are 100% good in my opinion for this assignment yeah you might actually bag 10 out of 30 in the next one you never know if your group sort of performs badly uh so so i uh, i hope you are all getting along well with your group members because this is how it's going to be till the next end of the program yeah 
So yes, please sir. go and do whatever you do and get along well with them. Don't fight and then come to me. I am not your mother or uncle or something. So foundations of group behavior is something that we will uh, be talking about. And um, why should we be talking about? So for example, let me give you a scenario. Let me give you a scenario. You are 10 people and your boss, who is a powerful guy, takes you to a restaurant for lunch. And at lunch table, restaurant, you don't get, he, he doesn't get his favorite um, seat at the table and he's very angry. And then shouts at the poor waiter and says, give me the, my table. So waiter says, not possible, it's already reserved by somebody else. And then he kicks up a scene. And then um, one of your group members says something nasty about uh, the waiter and the boss also agrees, everybody laughs. Is this normal behavior? What would you do? Would you say something or would you keep quiet? You will ask him to stop. Your boss was a powerful guy. No, I'm sure. You will? Okay, fine. But most of the time, so I, uh, uh, all these gentlemen who are looking at their cell phone uh, seem to not have anything to say. Yeah? Would you say something? Why? Why won't you tell your boss anything? So you don't feel anything that your boss is acting funny with the waiter. So what bothers you actually? I think you didn't hear what I was saying, but concentrating on your phone. So let me ask somebody else. Why would a majority of us keep quiet? You don't want to upset the boss because not necessarily. Why do you want to upset the boss? Because you're looking at short-term rewards. Short-term rewards in terms of maybe the next promotion, the next increment, and so on and so forth are something that bother more, most of us. So group dynamics or group behavior is a problem for several people. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next about 45 minutes. So um, how does status in a group? So I was talking about status, actually, here. the boss and you. And size, does size affect a group? Does the size of a group? So all these are based on fundamentally deep research. And they've come out with some understanding, which we shall be kind of talking about as we go through the next 45 minutes. But a fascinating subject is group. And I, I don't know whether I told you the story about um, several years ago, more than 10 years ago, when um, there's a powerful trade union in a company called Maruti Suzuki. And uh, Maruti Suzuki was having in Gurugram, present day Gurugram. Yeah? And they were having a negotiation with the management on salary increase. and. Um, the, the, the HR manager, a vice president or something, he comes out of his office and he's walking towards his car and a set of workers, a big mob of more than 500 people, you know, catch hold of him, put him into the car and the doors are locked. Petrol is poured from the outside and the car is lit, put on fire and the poor man dies. Is this normal behavior? Why do you think it happened? Hmm? Yeah. So that is the problem with groups and group behavior. And when it went to court eventually, they said, we didn't do it. We were part of a group. But the judge did not look at it that way. And he looked at personal liability and responsibility. About 10 of them got life sentences, hard labor in jail and several other people got different you know sentences all of them lost their jobs so group dynamics is a little peculiar because and i keep telling this to a lot of people because we assume we assume that once we are in a group we are not personally responsible or liable for our actions it is farthest from the truth and also group it has been seen that your courage, when you are alone, you are a little afraid. But when you get into a group, 
your confidence levels and your courage levels seem to increase rise yeah rise again don't make that mistake yeah because because eventually whether you do it or a group does it does it you are personally liable for whatever your actions are so again the size of the group matters the cohesiveness so which is better very cohesive groups are good you know what's group cohesiveness how close the bonding is so are closely bonded groups good or not good what are the disadvantages what are the disadvantages of a of a closely bound group not necessary okay might easily get influenced okay so there was this interesting case of uh, <clears throat> i'll i'll quickly conclude this just to make you understand why group cohesiveness can be a problem so there is this there is a ship called the exxon valdez the exxon valdez about 25 years ago sailed from a port called anchorage in alaska and it was going to california carrying crude oil and it was carrying 58000 tons of crude oil which is a middling amount you got much bigger ships the ship hit a sand bar that is it hit sand and it sort of broke into two it spilt 58000 tons of crude oil into the sea today 25 years later the effects of that crude oil in the sea is being felt by flora and fauna in that and that's a beautiful country if you go through the bering straits and go to alaska that is beautiful brilliant clear water lot of animals sea animals birds several of them died and some some species were wiped out because of the oil in the sea when they went to enquiry they found that the captain was a drunkard yeah and he was actually drunk and sleeping when in the the ship had to be navigated it was given to a junior guy who sank it eventually but the problem was when it went to court they called his crew and asked him what do you think of this captain he also is an excellent guy he's a drunkard but he's an excellent guy and he we were all very close to each other so the, so this is the point that i'm trying to make here is that cohesiveness is good but too much of cohesiveness is a problem when wrong doing is not reported yeah and that is why companies have got what is called as whistle blowers you know what's a whistle blower you have whistle blower policies in your companies no somebody who reports wrong doing yes. yeah so for example so for example so for example suppose you are a group of six women and your boss is um harassing one person do you report it or do you keep quiet we do so companies have also got policies for such for such issues where you have you can be anonymous but report wrong doings in your or you find somebody embezzling money or doing unethical things how do you report this without getting personally exposed to you think your boss is going to like it if you're going to report about him so he's going to come after you right so do companies have policies for whistle blowers and so on and so forth so these are some things that are very important so what is a group a group is defined as two or more individuals interacting and interdependent who have come together to achieve particular objectives groups are not teams what's the difference between a group and a team we'll answer that in the probably in the next class but please understand there is a difference between a group and a team and you have formal group what are formal groups formal groups yeah like for example you're all your groups your study your assignment to groups are formal or informal groups they are formal, formal groups, groups yeah they have been set by the program director dr abhiji chakravarti and that's it yeah they are formal what is an informal group you form like for example yeah. while you are going in the break you go and Friends say the professor is useless he doesn't teach properly that's an informal groups. groups or you go outside the gate and have a smoke a cigarette that's a informal groups that's an informal groups group so you can have both kinds of 
what's the difference between a formal and informal group fundamentally so formal so, groups have a level of authority they have been set from the top down right and um, they have formal charters and practices and so on and so forth which i suggest you also should do have a charter for your group you know establish what is right and wrong for example in your group will you accept somebody abusing another uh, group mate no Let's write it down say this behavior is not suppose you call for a meeting at 4 o'clock somebody turns up at 4:30 is it right not correct so if you 4 o'clock you have to come at 4 o'clock you have to be politely you have to address other people politely you have to be agreeable to establish a charter everybody gets an opportunity to speak um, otherwise and one guy doesn't sh sh you know shut everybody else down and so on and uh, so the last last trimester i had a group which had a steep gender divide so the men and the women started fighting yeah finally they of course they had a they got together and sorted it out and they did well yeah but then you if you don't have a charter you can have problems so you have something called why do people get into uh, groups because they have you have something called as the social identity theory please note that down and look it up considers when and why individuals consider themselves member of groups so uh, henry taffel said groups that is social class family football your own caste group are all social how many of you are in are you know proud to belong to a particular caste that's a group social group by itself yeah um football team in the uk say manchester united liverpool all these are football do you do you support rcb or uh, that super kings or some of those teams you know you are you identify with a particular group which people belong to were an important source of pride and self esteem so if when you don't have so this is very noticeable when you don't have too much of pride and self esteem in your own achievements you tend to gravitate towards groups yeah you want to be part of a larger group particularly when there is a sense of some amount of insecurity yeah um that's why you find that a lot of people revel or thrive in say religious groups caste groups because they get some amount of secure and they feel that you know they belong to something bigger than themselves yeah people have emotional reactions to the failure or success of their of their group because their self esteem gets tied to into the performance of the so my wife today morning was telling me rcb is not doing well so i said why are you interested in rcb why are you interested in rcb so she thought about it and she said yeah it doesn't have anybody from karnataka playing there that's the point so you should not be bothered about it so she sort of was a little quiet and she went off yeah to get me my breakfast but the point is that the point is that we feel a connect to some particular thing because we feel that our pride and self esteem is getting affected yeah and people always are in some some group or the other you need to be a little um careful about what groups you get into social identities help us understand who we are and where we fit in with so for example um are we all proud to be indian most of us are why it's again a social i'm proud to be an similarly somebody is proud to be a pakistani a chinese an american and so on and so forth and they have their own you know things going for them you also have so the problem here is that in organizations there are two things called in groups and out groups yeah so your boss will always have a look around your boss will always have an in group that is people who he call in case of trouble he reaches out to them first yeah so for example uh, in case i want some advice there is some pressure on me i will call this fellow these two fellows they are the in group and these four people are the out group so they will get to know last what is and most organizations unless the boss is very smart and he he is aware of such things 
you will have in groups and out groups and they are a some cause for concern with many many people so which group would you like to be in group and out group out group is it so in group people have in a sense some advantages because all rules don't apply to them so in group fellows will sort of have longer lunch breaks um they might have longer uh, smoke breaks they might have more leave and the boss is a, is is a, they might have better increments what are the dangers of being in the in group what else what is the bigger bigger danger boss leaves the organization and new boss comes yeah then suddenly you are left rudderless and adrift you don't know now how the boss what group the boss is going to have now the out group guys might become the in group and um, it could sort of actually so it's good to be a little neutral and you know uh, weigh your opportunities a little i mean where where you stand in terms of your boss a little carefully which group you are in social identity threat in groups and out groups pave the way for a social identity threat which is akin to stereo what is a stereotype threat stereotype all of do you stereotype what is a stereotype no 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 ah oh, very good excellent so for example when i was growing up in my batch when i went to college we were 120 people we came through an exa- uh, 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 all india examination so we had people from all, all over the country generally the assumption was all north indians are very strong physically but little depleted in the head all south indians are very intelligent but weak people which is utter nonsense yeah so that's a stereotype or all pakistanis are bad people terrorists is a stereotype so these are stereotypes that groups form why so that they can get better cohesion amongst themselves and then they can have some target it becomes problematic when you do two things you do stereotyping so give me an example of dangerous stereotype where stereotyping is taken to extremes yes of course yeah what happened to them ha ah, okay that was see that, that is you're just targeting them they because they were they yeah in a social identity theory there are different kind of people so they were targeted yes true i agree what else so some of the nastiest forms of stereotyping so stereo it happens in two ways one is you stereotype first of all that is and say that the other group is barbaric dangerous not good so on and so forth and then you label them and a classic example is what adolf hitler did so first he said that all jews are dirty people anti german they caused germany's loss in the first world war it started like that so they formed an out group of the of the jews and then you had a guy called joseph gobels who was their propaganda minister he quietly said that the jews are not only an out group they are also rats so this is called as labeling you set a label why it is so dangerous that now people don't think of them as humans they think of them as and when you think of somebody as a rat it becomes much easier to kill them yeah and that's what happened 6 and 1/2 million jews lost their lives from stereotyping labeling to concentration camps and being gassed so group theory in the in the worst forms groups can actually stereotype extremely this is harmless south indians are intelligent north indians are strong and all that stuff is a little harmless but when it gets to a genocide like what you said so so the the pandits in kashmir is becomes more you know painful and difficult so stereotyping is a problem in several countries including india 
and you must be as educated people you must be a little careful in stereotyping and one way of doing it is to get into dialogue try to understand where the other side is actually what is what is their cause and concern uh, cause for concern and then try to figure out is there a middle path and so on and so forth so fundamentally again i want you to remember that we get into groups because we want to have a social identity but when you carry that too far it becomes a problem yeah right so um um so the group, how do groups form how does your group form because we set the group for you but how do you get together and there's something called as the punctuated equilibrium model so what it says is that first you meet so first all of you must have i saw a lot of activity which group you are on some whatsapp some link was there all of you formed after that you have gone to sleep i am sure none of you have read the case even yeah that's what happens here phase 1 some activity nothing happens here why we got 3 months no problem yeah then after one and a half months have gone lot of activity happens then you figure out again you have got one month so phase 2 happens and then in the end hopefully you will lift your game and get the group this thing that is where you fight actually why because there is examination rush you don't know who is going to get how many marks the pressure builds and so on and so forth yeah so um this is the classic model in which called the punctuated equilibrium model in which groups form you should break this mold sensibly work from the first day i you know when i was doing my masters me and another guy we were um we were roommates and we were studying together also and out of sheer good luck uh we had a very tough viva in my uh, masters and out of sheer good luck i believe and god's grace i passed um the guy was also very intelligent very good boy and uh, he failed sort of unfortunately so he came and told me that you know this is not fair told him i totally agree with you he told me that i am more intelligent than you i said accepted but uh, he took it very badly and 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 sort of he didn't speak to me for a while and so on and so forth so the problem is that when pressure builds people start doing irrational things and so on and so forth so you can actually uh, break this model and work on it in a more sort of systematic manner so role well, why is a role in groups why is a role very important you know role what's the role what is the role what is my role now do i have any other role there's no front less what else the colleague so you can have so for, so when i was a uh, you know entertainment about uh, 50 years back was not too great and uh, i remember that where my dad used to work uh, every year we used to have the drama troupe which used to come and they were doing the <clears throat> um ramayan so the first day the we went to watch the ramayan the, there was this lady uh because i always in my head imagined that sita was a very pretty uh, lady you know so uh, that's what i read in books and comic books and so, so but, but this lady was not very pretty so it bothered me actually a little bit and uh, so so i had this question to my parents that what, you know i this is not fitting the regular mold so and the next day when i went this lady was playing another role she was playing um, rama's mother so i was very puzzled and i said how, but how can this sita become his mother so my parents said no it doesn't work like that this is a drama this is the role so the point here is that we play several several roles through our life and you have something called as role conflict which is more evident in women i keep repeating this but and that's why you get stressed and tension and so you're you i'm i'm a professor here i'm also a father i'm a husband i was a son to somebody uh, i'm a colleague like he said i have friends um i'm a boss to several people so you have several roles and how do you manage these roles and it was showed by a guy called philip zombardo zombardo was a strange guy he was mercurial he was a professor he was the head of the american psychological association he taught at stanford so zombardo did 
very interesting experiment. He caught hold of people like you, random fellows in his class, 50. He took them to the basement. The basement of his department, he converted into a jail. Make believe jail. And 20 people he put as prisoners in the jail. 30 of you he made into guards. And he said, one week you will all stay here. I want to watch your behavior. He found that the prisoners started becoming more and more submissive and quiet after day two and three. And the guards started becoming more and more aggressive, sadistic. And they started sort of beating these classmates of theirs. So what Zimbardo showed us is that, and he actually called off the experiment after about a week because he got alarmed with the behavior of people, the results. He, he said that people slip into their roles very easily. Yeah. So for example, some of these police fellows behave like policemen at home also. Does it work? So can I go home and tell my wife and son, I'm the dean? It's stupid, right? So you should be able to distinguish between a role and, and many people can't. Many people can't. And Zimba, there's another experiment called the Milgram experiment, which was conducted in the US. And I think I might have mentioned this. This experiment quickly shows as follows. So this guy called Milgram, he was a social scientist. He brought again several people. He advertised. He said, if you become part of my experiment, I'll pay you $5. This was 1946. A lot of money, $5 in 1946 for two hours. He called them. Experiment was simple. He said, there is a room here. There's one more room there. You go and sit in that room. Here I'm carrying out a quiz. If the person here say, this is the guy, this is the subject. I'm asking him a question. If he answers correctly, I will, you will hear nothing. If he gives a wrong answer, I will ring a bell. At that time, there is a wheel. You have to turn the wheel. So people asked him, what happens when he turn the wheel? They said, this fellow will get an electric shock. So they said, okay. So this Milgram is a, is a handsome guy, tall fellow here, white, white coat, stethoscope, everything. He was looked like an important guy, tie, suit. He found that 80% people gave an electric shock fictitiously to somebody sitting in this room. Only 20% people questioned, why am I giving a shock to a random person? And out of the, say, 50 people he called, only one got up and left saying this is nonsense. So what it goes to show is that we slip into roles very, very, very quickly. Now, if I come with great authority and say, give him, give him a stick and say, beat that fellow, he will beat him. Why? Because he assumes that Captain Nagaraj knows what he is doing. And so, there are, and, and, and so a lot of Germans at the end of Second World, normal people, they were asked, why did, we, why did you do this to the Jews? They said, no, somebody on the top told us to do it. So people slip into roles very, very easily and quickly without actually thinking whether what we are doing is right or wrong. And I, I must tell you, beside the program, as educated people, you must think a little bit. It is your job to use that piece of machinery and to figure out whether what you are doing is right or wrong. Otherwise, it could land you. And that's what groups do to us. Unfortunately, when you get into a group, you get into what is called as group think. Everybody in the group is doing it, so I should also participate. Like I gave you an example of your um, uh, manager. Why? Because it's good to keep quiet and confirm, which, is, uh, which was shown by another brilliant um, uh, experiment. Yeah. yeah, role conflict. Okay, Zimbardo's prison experiment, we talked about it. Participants easily and rapidly assumed roles that were very different from their inherent personality. Under normal circumstances, you're a normal good guy. You're a kind person. You feed the stray dog. But when I made you a prison guard, you went and wet up your classmates. Yeah, 
and which is a little which was unnerving and zimbardo actually got the shock of his life he stopped the experiment after a border 5 6 days actually it was supposed to go on for 2 weeks right and then so you have norms acceptable standards of behavior within a group that are shared by group so what are some of the norms that you have in your place of work what are the norms that you have dress decent yeah dress decent should you go uh, to the suppose suppose you one day go to the office in a sherwani with one uh, this thing and all that is it acceptable so people will wonder what the hell is wrong with this fellow why because group norms are so suppose you but you go to your marriage in somebody's marriage in boxer shorts is it acceptable so that is also not a group so people people have norms they you mean know, you're accept i expect you to have a bath and come to the class you know brush your teeth and come look presentable sit so everybody has a set of rules within which we and group set their rules yeah so for example if you are a member of and i i am not a member of say manchester united or liverpool if you are a member you are supposed to have a glass of beer while the football game is going on maybe i assume yeah they're all very fond of beer and so on and so forth so the groups have norms what else norms can you have the lang kind of language you speak you know so for example um the norm norm the, the language norms on board a ship when i was there were because it's a man's world at least when i was there we had no women officers or women crew we had wives who were there but not crew members so our language was very colorful huh? um which is very interesting that is the norm if i speak the way i speak now on a ship then people will say this guy is boring yeah but can i bring that language to the classroom here definitely no yeah because the norms are now different and they are shifted yeah and you must have the good sense to understand right so again again um um a recent study found that in task groups individuals emotions influence the group's emotions and uh, vice versa so um yeah so um do people's emotions affect a group the same the example that i gave you about the the maruti suzuki were people in an emotional high when they burned this guy yeah it is so they all came together in sort of putting this guy in a car and setting the car on fire so do and does it work both ways obviously you can actually um you know both can push the other up individual emotions can push up group emotions and group emotions can act on individual emotions and then you can sort of have a cascading effect in the reverse direction so this is a picture of from what do you think this picture is of course for all of you who have read history it's a very indicative the uniform is very indicative so these were children who were freed from auschwitz at the end of 1945 so these were children jewish children in a concentration camp in germany had it gone on for a little bit longer they would have all been put in a gas chamber and killed the question is why did it happen why didn't a normal german question whether it was okay to even kill children who were so why do genocides happen why do sets of people wipe out other sets of people yeah so these are interesting questions and it all comes back to a group identity yes mr francis can i help you mr francis no oh, francis has disappeared right and then you have uh, another interesting experiment called the ash experiment or ashes line conformity experiment and this guy professor solomon ash carried this out again an experiment in a classroom so what he did was very simple he drew four lines on the board 
on the blackboard and this was his class so he had several people sitting in the class all these were his friends 1 2 3 4 5 this guy was an innocent fellow so he asked the professor asked guy number 1 who was already been set up tell me this is the target line this line is equal to which line in this so this fellow deliberately said this target line is equal to line c is that the right answer but he said c so then he went to this fellow also his friend he also said c then he went to this fellow he also said c c then he suddenly came to this innocent fellow who had no idea what was going on and asked him what do you think so he says he can make out but he said c again what is called as group think why because we want to confirm with our group so this was a great experiment again in showing what is called as group think or group conformity where we rare that's why you will not actually step up and disagree with your group or your boss because there is comfort in confirming you know i am i am part of the group so i will not say anything different or i will not say anything negative with against the what my group is say so ash's experiment was kind of um very revealing to how groups actually function and these are deeply psychological uh, uh events that have been well researched yeah so you get the general idea so apparently people confirm for two main reasons because they want to fit in the group you all we all want to fit in and we don't want to say anything that is also what is called as normative influence and because they believe the group is better informed than they so what if my group is actually right and i am wrong so um the informational influence maybe because five people have said something maybe um it's good to agree with how do you break this effect so the point is as a manager you know now that something like this exists how do you break this that's the point the point is there the point is not listening to wonderful theories the point is how do you once you understand this how do you take this back to your workplace and very good rewarding the ones who voice their dissent okay good point agree what else can you do come on folk that's why you're taking this program dismantle the group how do you function my friend that depend on the situation because i feel uh, it can be uh, it it will always have a two ways it will be good and bad if it's a influencing for a uh, better thing so i feel i'll agree with the rewarding thing but however if it says that it is influencing in a negative way then i would better go with the dismantling or i would rather um uh, you know uh, moving that person to the maybe different team so that you know uh, or the negativity can be removed so it has again two phases whether it is influencing in a good way or a bad way no, so i would think so but a lot of english but i didn't understand anything that was said <laughs> okay uh so am i not audible is that no, you are very audible you are very audible okay. very crystal clear okay. in what in the in the what you said hmm. but the point the point is that the point i'm trying to ask you can't dismantle the group no That's not the dismantle group. the group but if a particular if if everybody is agreeing to one person so i'm saying it can influence in either good way or bad way if it's good way mostly so, in the uh, bad way most yes, if if way. nobody if nobody is questioning what somebody says all the time there is a problem yes there is there, let us take it there is, there is a problem suppose you are suppose you are in a group of 10 people and your one person is every time voicing an opinion everybody nods their head is there a problem there is a problem there is a problem yes how do you i my question to all of you is how do you rectify it 
One way is to have uh, assertive uh, uh, training for the rest of uh, uh, members. One way is to have assertive training. So you also have a point of view. And, and in, a, in a sense, that is what is called as a devil's advocate. That is, groups are encouraged. One person in a group is encouraged to voice a dissenting opinion so that you have a discussion or you have a debate. It's called devil. Please note down that word and look at it, devil's advocate. Yeah. And where you sort of come out with a dissenting point of view or a dissenting opinion. Yeah. What else? Yeah. So first of all, for you to come up with an alternative solution, you have to have what? I agree. But how did that happen? So out of, out of, uh, out of um, thin air, you can't expect people to come up with points of view that are different. How do you, the, the question that I'm asking is, how do you constitute your group so that you have people who will come with alternative thought processes? Very good. Excellent. Excellent. But more naturally, how do you make this happen? And I think I covered it in my first class. Okay. What else? I, I want to take you back beyond, behind that. At the genesis. How do good managers, who is a good manager? No, so this, this room is on fire. Should I ask all of you your opinion? What should we do next, sir? Um, while, while we're getting fried here, uh, we all have a joint one kind of a colloquium and meeting. Is that what you want me to do? Obviously, no, right? So what do you, how do you generate different points of view in a group? Uh, like, uh, um, uh, I mean, from the manager- I don't want a long answer. I want one word. Yeah, by probing. By probing the team no. for them to talk. First class, I covered it. We we'll asked the team to go through the organization theory no, and no. behavior analytics. I don't want to, I want one word. I told you. No. Sir, is it diversity? Yes, diversity. You need diversity in culture. You need diversity in cognition. What is called as cognitive? Diversity, ability to think. Cognitive thinking. Differently. That is why you have diverse kinds of people in a group. That's why it is a stupid idea to have all people from your caste, religion, and um, uh, language in a group. You can't do a more foolish thing than that. You want people who are different so that they can come up from different. It might make you uncomfortable, but I can tell you it will save you a lot of trouble in the Future, if people are coming up with different points of view, yeah, points of view which are, which can then be debated and examined, and then you can come to a common conclusion and decision in sort of what you want to do. But cognitive diversity is very important. I'm not saying, why do I use the word cognitive diversity? So, for example, the 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 you know the, the Americans when they opened their first multinational corporations, say in India, IBM, IBM in India was headed by an uh, American or an Indian. So the Americans are very interesting. They follow what is called as a polycentric approach to staffing. That is, they don't bring other Americans, or at least they don't. So what they decided to do was, they brought an American. They brought an Indian who was an American. So outside he looked like an Indian, but culturally he was an American. And this is what is called as the coconut syndrome. The coconut syndrome is brown outside, but white inside. 
and it didn't work because although this fellow looked like a indian his thought process was american and that's why i said cognitive diversity you can physically look different but mentally if your thought processes are the same it doesn't work you need people to think different they might look the same but they should think different and that's the important point that i was trying to make if you don't want problems like this to happen and you want to save yourself in the future you don't want things like the nazi uh, genocide which occurred against the jews and the germans what they did in various other parts of the world yeah so you know it can be it it can be actually be frightening um, there was this guy in china called mao tse tung <laughs> ಹಲೋ ಶ್ರೀಧರ್ ಇನಾಮದಾರ್ ಓಕೆ so the, the guy called mao tse tung you know mao do you know who mao is this is my test case my barometer do you know who mao is mao tse tung that means many of you don't know who mao is yeah mm-hmm. mao was the uh, premier of china one of their great leaders after the chinese communist revolution in the 1930s mao was an interesting fellow he was wanted greatness for china weekly so mao went to the soviet union those days who had a russian he was a little kind peculiar kind of guy his name was nikita khrushchev very interesting chap so mao asked khrushchev tell me how do we become powerful like the americans and the british what is the one thing that we need to do and khrushchev tells him steel you have to produce iron and steel if you produce iron and steel like they produce your country will become a powerful country so mao comes back he buys this story he has a meeting of his politburo some 10 fellows and he says that we have to produce steel from tomorrow i want our steel production so he called 1 2 3 4 5 7 8 fellows how does this happen this is look every family in china should produce 10 tons of if you have that you multiply number of families 10 tons we will have production greater than united states and britain he said superb that's why i like you fellows all good chaps you come up with a workable solution go and declare it and any family that does not do this will be punished so they went and told so families first of suppose suppose i tell you tomorrow go and produce steel how will you do it he has no idea he is sitting and doing code in some it company so that's what happened and families could not sort of figure out what to do now but they also feared the chinese authority system and they melted whatever utensils they had at home they had plows they had axes they had villagers they were terrified they melted it and gave some crude quality metal and said take this this is all we could manage it led to the greatest famine known to mankind in china in the 1950s they estimate that between 30 to 40 million people died of starvation when mao was asking his people how is my experiment going what did they say what did the 10 jokers tell him you are a genius your idea was every family is happy they are producing steel and it shocked him actually when so many when famine hit and so many people so group think that i'm talking about is a very dangerous particularly when um sort of was it time no okay can you go and call the chap in here so oh, you don't know who called him last time hmm. you know where he is yes you know so a uh, group think is very dangerous when you sort of have problems and i shall show you 
as usual, a couple of videos before we end the class and uh, to make it a little bit more, to add some um, sugar to the whole fairly kind of intense and boring class. So guys online, do you have any question? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Okay, no, sir. Give me uh, two, three minutes. What is there to explain? It's very clear. Have you read the instructions? So read it first. After you read it, if you don't understand, then I'll... So for that, only you have to pick two from the list of the documents provided, right? What? For the what? assignment two, uh, there is a list of uh, PDF set, and from that, we just have to select any two of them, right? Every group has been assigned with two case studies. Please read it multiple number of times. Everybody in your group is supposed to reach, read each case study thoroughly. Every member should be able to individually present the group, uh, present the case study, and then read the instructions carefully. No, not this one. I want to play the other one. No, the other one. Huh. So, uh, okay. So, uh, this is a video of, um, it's very interesting. I want you to link what I've been teaching to what happens here. This is a this is a nuclear submarine, and they have received instructions, or so they think. The captain thinks of firing nuclear weapons. The unfortunate part is the message that he receives from uh, from 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 Washington is not very clear. So he has to now make a decision whether to go by that unclear message or no. And then several other things happen. This is very interesting. A very interesting movie. You should go and watch it. It's called. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, uh, Crimson, it's called it's called Crimson Tide. Yeah, so let's watch this very interesting video. Some brilliant acting and it happened. So just think about it. One guy wants to launch nuclear weapons. Yeah, missiles on unclear instructions. So did what his executive officer EXO. Um, Denzel Washington, that's the black guy. What he did was right or not right? This is fictitious, very unlikely to happen on a, a warship or a submarine and things like that. But I'm just giving you the broader context. Had they launched, it would have been a, it would have been a, it would have been a wrong decision because they would have, first of all, as it turns out in the end that he was right, the, the junior guy was right and the senior guy was Wrong. So the, wrong, yeah. And it would have ended up in a retaliatory strike from the Russians, maybe. Yeah. And then it would have been sort of bad for everybody. So group think where everybody thinks the same can actually be very dangerous in several, several situations, including organizations. And that is why you need people to think out of the box. Not necessarily out of the box, differently. Differently. Yeah? Out of the box is a very big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So to think a little differently so that we have a different point of view. And um, yeah, I'm just the next. So the next one is again, um, I, I, I'll play this. I want you to tell me what you think. I won't give you. So this is about a school inquiry. Yeah? Uh, uh, this is Shah Rukh Khan. It's very short, right? Okay, we'll, we'll hold on to this for the, for the moment. Uh, that one, the other one. Yeah, stirring speech, correct. No. This one, hey, hold on, hold on. So this is about a school boy. He's a poor school boy. He's on a scholarship to a, uh, these were all things when I was growing up. So I am very fond of these movies. And um, uh, the boy is being tried for disciplinary action because a set of kids have insulted the headmaster. He's picking on this boy because he's easy to pick on. He's, 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 Poor, he's on a scholarship, so it's easy to threaten him. Other than that, this is a very prestigious school, so a lot of rich people come there. 
and this is about that so his guardian comes to kind of defend him it's a very interesting speech and we shall watch it yeah go ahead him sir Sims, you are a cover-up artist and you are a liar. But not a snitch. Excuse me? No, I don't think I will. Mr. Slade. This is such a crock of shit. Please watch your language, Mr. Slade. You are in the Baird school, not a barracks. Mr. Sims, I will give you one final opportunity to speak on. Mr. Sims doesn't want it. He doesn't need to be labeled still worthy of being a bad man. What the hell is that? What is your motto here? Boys, inform on your classmates, save your hide. Anything short of that, we're going to burn you at the stake? Well, gentlemen, when the shit hits the fan, some guys run and some guys stay. Here's Charlie facing the fire and there's George hiding in Big Daddy's pocket. And what are you doing? You're going to reward George and destroy Charlie. Are you finished, Mr. Slade? No, I'm just getting warmed up. I don't know who went to this place. William Howard Taft, William Jennings Bride, William Tell, whoever. Their spirit is dead, if they ever had one. It's gone. You're building a rat ship here. A vessel for seagoing snitches. And if you think you're preparing these minnows for manhood, you better think again. Because I say you are killing the very spirit this institution proclaims it instills. What a sham. What kind of a show are you guys putting on here today? I mean, the only class in this act is sitting next to me. And I'm here to tell you, this boy's soul is intact. It's non-negotiable. You know how I know? Someone here, and I'm not going to say who, offered to buy it. Only Charlie here wasn't selling. Sir, you're out of order. I don't order. I show you out of order. You don't know what out of order is, Mr. Trask. I'd show you, but I'm too old. I'm too tired. I'm too fucking blind. If I were the man I was five years ago, I'd take a flamethrower to this place. Out of order. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? I've been around, you know. There was a time I could see. And I have seen boys like these, younger than these, their arms torn out, their legs ripped off. But there is nothing like the sight of an amputated spirit. There is no prosthetic for that. You think you're merely sending this splendid foot soldier back home to Argonne with his tail between his legs, but I say you are executing his soul! And why? Because he's not a bad man. Bad men. You hurt this boy, you're gonna be bad bums. The lot of you. And Harry, Jimmy, Trent, wherever you are out there, fuck you too! Stand down, Mr. Slade. I'm not finished. As I came in here, I heard those words. Cradle of leadership. Well, when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And it has fallen here. It has fallen. Makers of men. Creators of leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. I don't know. If Charlie's silence here today is right or wrong, I'm not a judge or jury, but I can tell you this. He won't sell anybody out to buy his future. And that, my friends, is called integrity. That's called courage. Now that's the stuff leaders should be made of.
Now, I have come to the crossroads in my life. I always knew what the right path was. Without exception, I knew, but I never took it. You know why? It was too damn hard. Now, here's Charlie. He's come to the crossroads. He has chosen a path. It's the right path. It's a path made of principle that leads to character. Let him continue on his journey. You hold this boy's future in your hands, committee. It's a valuable future. Believe me, don't destroy it. Protect it. Embrace it. It's going to make you proud one day, I promise you. Okay, so um, so this boy is actually in a disciplinary committee. He has to. He's not telling the. He's not telling what actually happened. He knows. You think he's right or wrong? If you look at it dispassionately, do you think he's right or wrong? By not telling the truth. Yeah. So you can also get into situations, and then what do you think of the speech? Amazing. So eventually what happens is the boy is let off. Yeah. You can have people who are very, you know, who make speeches like this, who can actually twist, use emotions to change the process of decision making. And that is called group shift. I told you about group think where everybody agrees to everybody else. You can have group shift where a group shifts from the actual right path to doing something which is not very Correct. And that is why you have great orators. You have people like, say, Hitler or um, other great orators who can actually change the course of action. And that's something also you must keep in mind in group dynamics. Yeah. We'll watch Mr. Shah Rukh Khan in the next class where I will continue. I have got a couple of slides to go. But since we have come towards the time, 12.30, it's time for lunch. So, um, uh, guys on guys online, do you have any questions at all about anything? No, no sir. No, no sir. No, no sir. So everything fine. All assignment two is fine. Also. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Assignment two. Let me repeat. Every group has got two case studies. Everybody, don't this. Don't please split that case into first three pages. Mr. X will read. Then uh, next three pages, Miss Y will read. Then we'll all come together. What eventually happens is one of them is missing on the appointed day. And the group doesn't know what to do next. Then there are a lot of fighting happens during the presentation. Saying that, you know, the person was supposed to come. He didn't come. Not responsible and all that. So please prepare properly. I also want to remind you again that all of you are working professionals, which means that you have to come up with better Better presentations. Yeah. And then my MBA kids who are all about 22 years old. Okay. See you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Presentation is not recording. Presentation is synchronous live online. It'll happen 